Hey, if you have your Bible on you tonight, Jesse and I, we're going to teach a little bit together, and uh, we're going to hang out a little bit together and talk through the Word of God, but I want you to open it up to the, uh, the epistle of First Peter. We're going to go to First Peter chapter 5, First Peter chapter 5, and I'll tell you, if I could have just a little more monitor, guys, make my liver quiver. I preached way too hard this weekend. Uh, First Peter chapter 5, we're going to start reading in verse 8. And I'm going to set it up. Jesse's going to help me teach as well. Here's what it says. You want to read that? Read sure. down through there. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Yeah, the Bible says that we're to be sober. Everybody say sober. Sober. It means you keep your head about you as a Christian. How many know as a human, we're typically the worst whenever we lose our cool or lose our head? You could think about a drunk. I was in downtown Anchorage uh, just the other day getting ready to get on my flight. I drive around. There are tons of homeless in downtown Anchorage. And uh, it's sporty looking down there. It's like you ought to be ready. You know what I mean? Any, it looks like anything could happen. It's almost like, like the drug problem's bad enough down there. It looks like the walking dead just kind of around in the streets. And I'm talking to a guy in a store, and I say this to him. I say, tell me, do the homeless give you a ton of trouble? We minister to them, but I also know a lot of times there's real um, psychiatric problems. There's real addiction problems. You do homeless ministry, you got to pay attention, you know. You can't just act like it's going to be like ministering to toddlers or something. It's a, it's a gritty world. And I say, tell me, do you get a lot of problems out of the homeless? He says, to be honest, I get more problems out of the drunks out of the bar right here than I do the homeless guys. Yeah. And, and, the, and the guys with the big problems, he's like, the drunks cause the trouble. See, they don't think straight. They do crazy stuff. That's why the Bible says be sober. Come on, somebody say be sober. Be sober. The next thing he says is to be vigilant. That's to pay attention. Look at your neighbor and say, look alive. Just tell them that, huh? Look alive. Look alive. Man, I'll tell you what, when I was a kid and I'd be looking down or not paying attention or looking at the phone, my dad would smack me across the chest. Boom, look alive, son. Pay attention. How many of y'all ever had a coach tell you to look alive, playing ball or something? Look alive, head up, shoulders back, pay attention. You're going to get knocked out out here. And they say all that to warn you, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary is like a roaring lion, the devil. And he goes about seeking whom he might devour. He, he, I love this, uh, how the, the scripture is clearly letting us know that he is going about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. God is clearly letting us know that he is not a roaring lion. He is toothless. He's trying to be a fake Jesus because Jesus is actually the lion, you know, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yes. And all that the devil tries to do is come in to our environment and pretend like he has power that is over us. But the truth of the matter is that the Bible says that he has caused us to tread on the devil, that the devil is under our feet, that we are actually in charge of him, that we get to have authority over the enemy. And the only trick the devil has is trying to act as toothy as possible so that he can get you to back down thinking that he has the power that Jesus has. See, the devil is a bully. And the way he exercises his will on the world is by pretending he has the same power that Jesus has and tricking the church into believing it. But I believe that we have a group of believers right here in Amarillo, Texas, that you know that you're not running from the devil. Come on, somebody. But the devil is running from you. He doesn't have authority in your house. You have authority in his house. He doesn't tell you what to do. You put him in his place. Somebody say amen. amen. You know, I, I grew up with a kid named Michael. And uh, back whenever I, I was going through school, I graduated in 95, and now you can be a nerd and be cool. Such Come on. a good day to live. And most of the billionaires on the earth are tech nerds, right? We, we can all be working for nerds now. But how many know back in the 80s and 90s, it was different for nerds? Wasn't it in school? There was this kid that grew up with us by the name of Michael. I love Michael. Michael and I started like kindergarten together. And Michael's mother did him no favor because she bought him the dorkiest pair of glasses a kid could ever wear, right? So people are just riding Michael about his glasses. Michael doesn't look like a big guy. He doesn't look that tough. And then we go all the way through grade school and we get into high school. 
How many know that freshman year in high school, you're setting the stage for like four years of life then, right? You better get, look at your neighbor and say, get your bluff in now. That's all I'm saying. You better get it in now. So Michael starts cruising the hallway from the classroom down to the lunch hall. And that's the walk where anything can happen, right? Anything can happen between that, that second period and lunch. And they're picking on Michael, calling Michael names. They're knocking Michael's books out of his hand. You know, they're calling him dweeb and other things I'm not going to say in here. And they're pushing Michael around, and Michael takes it for weeks. And Michael takes it for months. Michael doesn't understand yet what the kind of power that Michael was packing. One day we're walking down that hallway and we're on our way to lunch and they pushed Michael one more time and Michael had all he could stand and he couldn't stand no more, like Papa says. And Michael turns around and throws this right hook and I'm telling you, he could punch like Mike Tyson. The first kid hit the ground, blood flew all over the, the floor behind him and then the other kid that was mouthing at Michael, Michael beat the brakes off of him too and I watched a lamb turn into a lion in one moment and Michael just beat them all up and then the they come to get Michael. Michael had never even been in trouble before. He's crying. He's going to the principal's office. He can't believe what he's just done. But I'll tell you what, when he walked out of that principal's office, we all had a brand new respect for Michael, and we came around him with our hat in our hand. See, a lot of the church thinks that the devil has the edge on them, just like Michael thought those bullies had the edge in the hallway. But when you figure out that the devil is not a lion, but goes about like a roaring lion, you can walk down that hallway with authority and eat your lunch without a problem. Come on. Somebody give Jesus a hand Amen. clap. You got a Michael on the inside of you. In the spirit, you need to let loose. Amen. Whenever I was a little girl, my dad used to say, uh, girls, I want you to say this with me. I think it was because he didn't have any boys, so he needed this in his life. But he'd say, uh, girls, I want you to say this with me. We chew up devils and spit them out for breakfast. And I would say, I think he was listening to a lot of Jerry Savelle at that point. He said, we will chew devils up and spit them out for breakfast. And so we started saying, we'll chew devils up and spit them out for breakfast. Of course, we're like little and there's like a big bow in our hair, you know. We didn't look very convincing, but something happened on the inside of us where your spirit begins to respond to the fact, no, I, I have authority here. I don't bend and bow to the devil. He bends and bows to me. One of Amen. the most dangerous positions that a Christian can be in is to not know that they choose chew devils up and spit them out for breakfast, that the devil responds to me. When I wake up, I decide today. The devil doesn't decide today. I have the authority of a believer in my life, and I know who I am in God. When believers don't know their authority, they live in lives that were never created for them, and they don't ever in, enter into the life that God actually has for them. So we want to talk a little bit about knowing who you are in God and what what to do to get that authority in your life. Amen. I want to prophesy to you right there, third row back. You just saw me looking at you. You got the, uh, is that an olive shirt on? Is that olive colored? I have enough girls. I He's know how to say that. I'm doing pretty good now, right? You know, I, I dress myself and I walk out and they look at me and they're like, no. no, no, you just go back, Brian. So I go back and come out. But I'm, I think that's an olive shirt. And uh, I, I can see where the, the, uh, the enemy came up against you like with an attack. Um, it was like a darkness that came at you, around you, on the inside. People on the outside might not have even felt it or seen it. People that were close to you might have recognized it or identified it. And it was like a darkness, and it was a play, and it was coming to steal your soul because of the great potential and the great grace and the great favor that God's going to put on your life in the future. For the Spirit of the Lord says you're like the perfect piece in a chess game and that God's going to play you in the perfect play at the perfect time, and you're going to be positioned in a land that'll flow with a supernatural flow like milk and with honey. There's going to be people that'll come that have been close to you in the past. In the future, the blessing of God will come on you in such a supernatural way. They'll begin to be jealous of you. Some of those that have been with you will peel off because God's goodness and God's grace will be so, so next level. They won't even understand what God's going to do. So I'm telling you, there's a new light that's about to be released to you. You're going to see some things about your future and about people around you, and you're going to have have light on decisions and it's going to be like you're not walking in a darkness you're not wondering what to do there'll be some this is the way I'm supposed to walk moments and decisions and if you make them now the spirit of the Lord says you choose wisely in the next 24 months I'm going to set you up for supernatural success for the next 24 years come on somebody give God a hand clap 
I'm telling you, God's gonna do something in your soul, in your heart. Olive shirt, all right, all right. Come on, come on, somebody give God one more hand clap for a moment. God's gonna do something in your soul. Might just lift your hand just right in front of you like this, just right there, olive shirt, just like this. If I was really good at this, I'd know your name, right? I'd be so prophetic, I'd know your name. Best I can do is olive shirt, but all right. All right, Father, I pray in Jesus' mighty name that you'd fill her soul, you'd fill that hand, you'd fill that heart to overflow in the hours and days to come. Lord, I say rivers flow forth supernaturally into her life in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say amen, 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 amen. The devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking to make devour. So you gotta look alive. We've been talking about it. I'm in Alaska. Here's what they give you when you preach in Alaska. I'm staying in a cabin outside of Wasilla. They're like, Pastor, here's the key to your, uh, your cabin. Uh, Pastor Chris McDonald was with me uh, from down in Marion. He was here at church. Many of you know Pastor Chris. They said, now here's the key to the van. Take this with you. They said, now here's a 44 Magnum, all right? And uh, when you walk out of your cabin, keep your head on a swivel. Because it's not like walking out of a cabin in Kentucky. When you walk out of a cabin in Alaska, there are grizzly bears, there are moose up there that are like the size of a, of a, of a van or a car or something. It's, incra- it's the craziest looking animal you've ever seen. And they can kill you. It's like there's everything up here can kill you and you gotta pay attention. And he started telling us a story about a hunting bear. And I don't know if he's just trying to scare me or, or if it's a real story, but it's so good I'm gonna tell you tonight and we'll, we'll let heaven straighten out the details later. But he'd been in Alaska five years and he decides he wants to go bear hunting. And uh, he said there was a guy in his church that was a, a collegiate wrestler and a and high-level collegiate wrestler, incredible athlete that was raised in Alaska, cut his teeth up there. He said he knew everything about Alaska, took him with him. He's like, you know, he's like, I'm a greenhorn. I'm five years in Alaska. I don't know what's up. You know, the smartest thing we can do when we don't know what's up in a place where we're at is tell the people we're with that we don't know what's up. Somebody say amen. <laughs> How many know it never helps you to act like you know what you're doing when you don't, right? You know, because most of the time it's trouble in dangerous situations. And so he said that they spot these bears somehow from the water and they come up around the mountain and they're going to kill this grizzly bear. And they say then all of a sudden they see that the grizzly bear has a cub with her. You can't kill one with a cub, it's illegal. And so the, the guy that was coaching him, the, the young wrestling guy, college guy, says don't shoot, don't shoot, it's a mama with a cub, don't shoot, it's illegal. So he pulls off and he says when he pulls off, that bear heard them turned and looked. And he said when the bear turned and looked their way, that wrestler kid said he grabbed him by his shirt, pulled him right up to his face. And he said, come with me now. And he said he took up running off the mountain as fast as he could up the mountain. He said, this kid's dragging me wide open. I don't know what's happening. He says, we get up into cover up around the mountain. He says, listen to me. We are about to be, be attacked. Do you understand me? That bear's coming after us right now. Get serious, get back to back. And he said, every hair on my body stood up. He's like, my God, what am I doing here? I'm a New York boy. Why did I want to hunt a grizzly bear? You know, he's like, holy moly. And he said, this she bear comes up over the hill, stands up for a second. They're, they're not gonna, they say they don't stand up like on the movies, typically. They just charge you, they run at you. Just like a, just like a bull or something would run you over. And, uh, that, that wrestler jumped up and screamed. He said, we had a moment where it was, it was on. It was just like this. This was a moment. And then the bear turned around and left by the grace of God. But here's why do, I tell, why do we tell that story. All right, we tell that story because we want you to know that there is a bear outside of your home. Come on, somebody. There is a wolf outside of the door. There is a a, a wolf in sheep's clothing somewhere in this room right now. I promise you by percentage, I know it. And in life, either you identify and you check out and you find the bear or the wolf or, or the wolf in sheep's clothing, there's a day in life where either you kill the bear or the bear kills you. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be bear food. I want to kill the bear. Be sober, be vigilant, pay attention because your adversary goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not going to be me. Just tell him that. So how do we devour proof our houses? 
How do we do that, Jesse? I think a good place to start is prayer. Everyone knows that we should pray, but how many of you have ever found it difficult to pray? If you've ever tried to pray and you're praying and you're praying and you feel like you just poured everything out to God and then you look down and it's only been two minutes, it's very discouraging. So I think prayer is one of the, the biggest things because God has given us a secret weapon of prayer. We get to talk to God any time that we want to. I wonder sometimes why God didn't set the prayer time from two to three in the afternoon and it was the only time we could show up because that's what the hairdresser does and we never miss an appointment. Oh, that's good. I mean, you talk, to, you talk to a girl who's got a nail appointment, her baby could have just gotten cut, needs some stitches. She'll say, you'll be fine for another hour, baby. We're going to just get this nail. We're just going to get this nail appointment taken care of. Then we'll get those stitches. Now, don't lie. You know you did it. I mean, I know you. I know women. They, it's like, just tie that tourniquet really high. You won't bleed back. I'll be back from the salon soon. So true. We'll go to a doctor's <laughs> appointment. We don't get in a hurry because we know the doctor's going to be two hours late. We bring extra extra reading. But when God tells us that we can actually come into his presence anytime, any day, it's like we lay back, like God will listen anytime. It's not that important right now. That's why it's important for us to set a time with God. And it's important that our children know that there is a time with God. It's very important that our kids know that they have a time with God. It's important that when things come up in our house that we stop with our kids and say, hey, you know what, there's only one person that can take care of this ultimately. Let's pray about this. We get the family together. We pray over our meals, but at mealtime we try to talk to our kids and ask them if, about things going on in their life, and then we stop and we want to remember to pray for our kids. As pastors, we pray for people all day long. And I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I forget to pray with my kids when they're bringing their thing to me. And then it'll hit me. Wait a second. I'm a professional. I know what to do with this. And how many of us just as Christians forget that we have something that we can do right now and just stop and pray? It's like, man, I didn't get my hour of prayer in, so I'm just not going to do anything. But the truth of the matter is five minutes is better than no minutes. And if We'll just join together in our household and cover it with the power of prayer. Something important happens in the spirit realm, and it, it's a protection. It, it's, a, it's a wall around our family. It's massive. Our, our apartment here right now, the air conditioning's gone out. It is. And so I walk in there today. You know what I mean? You walk in. How long does it take you to realize the air conditioner's out whenever you walk home? Especially out here in Texas. It's like, <laughs> holy moly. It's like the bowels of hell have entered into my living room somehow here. How did this happen? Why? Why? Well, the AC's out, right? Okay, well, it's why? It's air conditioned. You ever walked into a room and you can tell it's been prayer conditioned, you know? Mm -hmm. The atmosphere's right. It's true. And houses are like that. I walk into houses and, and, and you go into some people's places, and you're like, man, Jesus is here. These are, these are Jesus people. I can tell. Yeah. There's an anointing in the room. That, that's because it's been prayer conditioned. And you can tell when there's something funky in the room. Come on, somebody. Something weird in here, right? What's up with that? I feel that, I feel that funky in the room. Why? It all comes down to prayer. And I'm telling you, if you'll build a family altar... You'll build a place of prayer in your house and you'll have a space of prayer and a time of prayer. You'll change the atmosphere of your house and your family and your children. Prayer is powerful. So true. It is. It's true. I think there's simple ways that we can do this. I want to mention this because it happened to me last night. I was gathered with other believers. There were other people around me and we were talking about Jesus. Do you know one of the best things you can do in your house is just talk about Jesus? The other night, Justice said, Mama, can I read you a story out of the Bible? Because he's learning to read real well. And I said, I was tired. And I thought, oh, man, this is going to take a long time. Because he wanted to read David and Goliath. And I knew we were going to have to get through the word Philistine. I'm like, oh, I just don't know if I have it tonight. <laughs> I said, buddy, how about you tell me the story of David and Goliath? He said, nope, I want to read it to you. I said, oh, okay, all right, yep, that's great, fantastic. Hoping I can live through it. Hoping I can stay awake through it. And he begins to read. He gets about three scriptures. And he says, hey, mama, how about I tell you this story? <laughs> It was getting too hard. I got let off the hook. But, you know, just talking about Jesus, telling your kids God's stories, things that the Lord's done for your family. Last night I was gathered with a few believers, and we were talking about Jesus. And all of a sudden, 
the presence of God just came into the room. I mean, you could feel it in such a special way. And I said, guys, let's stop right now. Let's not ever let the presence of God come into our house without us stopping and honoring it with a pause, with an admission that it's there, with a, with a moment of honor for what God is bringing to us, that it's special. You know, you don't always have to feel God for him to be there, but how many of you know when you feel the presence of God, when you begin to talk to him, you'll start to feel him because he shows up anytime he's talked about in a special, special way. And whenever it happens, I encourage encourage you to honor it and teach your kids to just lift their hands up and let that presence soak into them because we want our kids to be so familiar, it, to feel like home, to be in the presence of God so much that if they ever decide to go out into the world, that it feels so weird, so strange, so alien to them that they just go, oh, I hate it here. I got to get back to the presence of God and they just run back home. That's what we want for our kids. Prayer and the, and the honoring of the spirit of God coming in the room is so special in your protection. Come on, we're going to be a place of prayer. Everybody say prayer. Prayer. Come on, we're going to be a place of the presence. Everybody say the presence. The presence. You honor the presence of God and there's a hedge that starts to come around about what you do. The next thing I think we ought to do if we want to have a place that keeps us aware of our adversary, keeps us sober and vigilant. It goes right with what Jesse was saying. We need to be the people of praise. Come on, somebody lift a hand to Jesus. Somebody give him a hand clap tonight. Yes, God. Let's we just take a moment by faith and praise him like we're supposed to. We Come on, somebody you. thank him for saving you and Lord, healing you, you delivering you from addiction. Somebody thank him for putting your marriage back together. Come on, somebody thanking him for that cancer not dying, causing you to die, but you live. Somebody ought to thank him for prospering you and lifting you. You came up in the ghetto and you got a job now. You're making six figures. You ought to be the person that gives him praise. Come on, it doesn't even make sense where you are. So God was with you. And if God be for you, who could be against you? See, just being the people of praise changes the atmosphere. And our churches ought to be hot spots of praise. Come on, somebody. Whenever we come into his courts, we got to come in with thanksgiving. We come in with praise, and we need to have that spirit. When you have that kind of spirit, you have the spirit of a champion and a spirit of victory. That, that kind of person that's, that can praise God no matter what happens. He's the guy or she's the lady that lifts the room. They change the atmosphere. You ever have that person, they come in, everybody else, it's a drag, it's a downer. Everything's going down. That one person with the spirit of praise can come in and change things. You ever been around somebody that will praise God when things were going wrong and you kind of felt bad about the things you've been saying? You ever been convicted like that? You know, they're just praising God anyway and I'm like a pastor and I'm like coming apart and I'm like, man, there's lessons to be learned here. Praise is powerful. It's a weapon. And I'm telling you, when you use it as a weapon, it begins to disturb and to shake the camp of your enemy. There are multiple stories in the Old Testament where Israel would go out to war. Whenever they go out to war, instead of sending the warriors first, they would send people to praise and worship the Lord first. And some of you have a war. You have, a, you have the, the lion is at your door right now. I know it by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God's giving you the prescription of praise. If you want to drive the lion out of the door, you go ahead and get a hold of the prescription yeah. of praise. And you lift up your hands and you open up your mouth. And come on, you get a word of, of praise in your mouth, even when it doesn't make sense. And I'm telling you, the devil in hell will get so confused that those demons, they'll turn on each other yeah. just like the enemies of Israel did, and they'll begin to kill their old yeah. army like they did in the Old Testament story. Come on, somebody ought to be praising God. Somebody ought to be giving him some glory. Somebody ought to be thankful. I'm telling you, tonight, we're the people of praise. So Jesse and I, We'll try to encourage each other to keep that kind of attitude. <laughs> it's true. And sometimes I'm the negatron and sometimes he's the negatron. But we just say, you know what? We're just going to lift up a spirit of praise. How many of you know things happen in life? There's no getting around it. There's just, you just got to praise your way through them. I still remember a specific time in our life. It was one of the darkest moments. Our church had grown to a certain point and we had seen God move. And we were really encouraged. And all of a sudden we felt like we got a little blindsided. Something big happened in our life. We had a miscarriage. 
miscarriage. And the same Sunday, I came in, and I was very, very emotional. And Brian said, you know, obviously, as any woman would be in that situation. And I came in, and I said, honey, I want to get up and encourage the people this morning. And he said, honey, you don't have to do that. You can just be a mom today. Just sit on the front row. You don't need to do anything. I said, no, I, I need to. I needed to serve the devil notice that he was not going to steal from me anymore. I got up in the pulpit that morning and I didn't say much. I'll tell you exactly what I said. I'll never forget it. When it came out of my mouth, the word of God just came out of my mouth. It was as if something exploded like a bomb went off in our sanctuary. I lifted both of my hands and I said, I will bless the Lord at all times. Our people knew exactly what was happening in our life. I said, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth and when I said it it was as if an explosion in the spirit just went off and I mean our people who are very conservative Catholic background Irish white people just lost it the whole sanctuary just began to scream and to shout and to praise and to glorify God and it was miraculous because it was like in that moment we received our victory that the devil devil wouldn't steal from us anymore, but that he would come back and he would pay. He would pay for what he had taken out of our life, that joy. And let me tell you something. I've had more people come from that moment in my life and say, Jesse, it changed me. It changed the way I praise through circumstances. It changed the way that I walk out my salvation. It wasn't any big deal. It was just one scripture that I said, but it was praise in the midst of the storm that broke the power of the enemy me on our life that day. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Josh, you'll go ahead and start coming. Amen. Worship team, bring bring me some people to worship. You got some worship team left around here? How many <laughs> y'all think we ought to praise God? We've been preaching about Amen. praising God before we get out of here. Amen. Come on, stand up on your feet, give God a hand clap as they're coming up here right now. I feel like we ought to respond. We ought to respond. We ought to respond with praise. We ought to respond with worship. We ought to respond with giving God glory. Father, I thank you right now. Lift your hand to heaven if you're comfortable with it. Just lift a hand to heaven. Father, I thank you right now that even though the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour, I thank you, Father, that you're raising up a standard in our life. You're raising up a standard in our family. You're raising up a standard in our sons and our daughters. Lord, I thank you that we won't be taken out by the evil one. I declare that these are Jesus' people. Lord, they hear the voice of the good shepherd. And no other voice will they follow. Father, I thank you that these are the people of God, that they make it. Some may fall at your left, some may fall at your right, but I'm telling you what, you're not going down. You're going to make it. You're going to come through on the other side. You're not the kind of people that quit. Come on, you're not the kind of people that tap out. You're not the kind of people the devil takes out. He might take that other guy out. He's not taking you out. He's not taking your house out. Not taking your sons or your granddaughter out. I'm telling you what, your kids are going to make it. Your marriage is going to make it. Come on, you're, you're, you're going higher in life. That devil, he's already been detoothed. He's already been declawed. He's already been defeated. His life has already been shaken. He's been absolutely defeated at Calvary's cross. And all he can do is roar like a lion. But there is a lion that's here. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's going to stand up on your behalf. Come on, I feel the lions getting ready to stand up on somebody's behalf. Tell you, whenever a lion roars, they say you can hear it from miles away. Say it'll absolutely send chills up and down your spine. I think I heard some number like five miles the other day. Sometimes they can be heard. It's quite a roar, isn't it? It's the lion of the tribe of Judah. You know what Judah means? It means praise. I think whenever the people of God begin to let the praises of God come out of their mouth that it's like that same lion the alpha the omega the beginning and the end he begins to roar through us now I'm telling you whenever that lion begins to roar the, the enemies of the lion they begin to feel his power they begin to feel his authority they begin to feel his ability they begin to feel his strength they begin to tremble and shudder you ever had something in the night make everything stand up on your body tell you whenever the people of God begin to praise God like that that kind of thing happens in the spirit realm. 
Some of you got some stuff happening around your house. I'm telling you, praise is the prescription. Praise is the prescription. Come on, lead us. Let's praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not with your blood. You bought my freedom. Hallelujah. For the cross. Come on, church. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. you got like strive for next level problems around your house I'm telling you we all go through seasons like that how many of y'all have ever had a season where there's been a real attack on your household come on let me see your hand out there let them know they're not by themselves if you got that kind of thing going on in your life i want to agree with you in prayer tonight i want you to come out of your seat right to this altar the church is going to keep praising god as we agree for your family for your household for you as a single just go ahead and come meet me right here right here don't don't be shy come on Come on, y'all give them a hand clap as they come. Y'all give them a hand clap as they come. Y'all make a straight line down through here. We're going to pray for you. And I want the pastors to get ready to help me. Pastor David, Pastor Jesse, any other pastors on snap? Uh, both of the Pastor Jesse's, Pastor Levon. We're going to walk down, make room for us to come right in front of you. We're going to pray for you. We're going to agree for you that God's going to work a great work in your house. Now I'm telling you, there's nothing we can do in the natural. We got, we got nothing to help you in the natural, but we got something on the inside of us, just like you do, the line of the tribe of Judah. And I'm believing that a roar is gonna release around your house, and it's gonna drive off the camp of your enemy. I'll tell you, there's some, there's some problems that are gonna be reversed, some things that are gonna happen. There's some reversal, there's some financial. I, I feel right now there's even like, a, there's like a legal financial battle there's a legal financial battle. There's a legal financial battle. God's gonna turn around. Something's gotten gritty, something's gotten nasty. I don't know if it's business or family, but I'm telling you what, God's gonna turn that thing around in your favor. If that's you, if that's you, you ought to just receive it by faith right now. If that's you, you ought to just receive that by faith right now. Right now, receive it. Now come on, receive it, receive it, receive it. Now let's do this, just begin to lift a hand to heaven. Lead us in worship, we're gonna to begin to pray for him. 